We can't blame you if you haven't been paying close attention to the Senate race in Kansas. After all, the last time a Democrat won a Senate race in Kansas, it was 1932. And to the extent you have been paying attention to this year's race, well, you probably stopped doing so a few weeks ago when longtime Republican incumbent Pat Roberts held off his Tea Party challenger, Milton Wolf, in the GOP primary. Wolf might have been the kind of erratic far-right candidate who could have maybe endangered the seat for the GOP. At least that's how the thinking went. But Roberts is a known commodity, and it's Kansas, after all, so he'd be fine in the fall. That was the thinking. But maybe it's time to start paying attention to Kansas again, because a surprising new poll this week suggests that this Senate race, the race in deep red Kansas, could end up as the sleeper race of 2014, the one that no one thought would be competitive but ends up being a dogfight. Here's Pat Roberts' current approval rating with voters, according to a new PPP poll. It's 27 percent. That's a poisonous level for an incumbent, 27 percent. His longevity, 34 years in Washington, is probably hurting him here. A revelation that he seems to live in someone else's house on a golf course to maintain his Kansas residency, that's not helping either. There's also the civil war that's now raging in the Kansas Republican Party between the Tea Party right and the more pragmatic traditional party establishment. The civil war that recently led 100 Republican officials to turn on Republican Governor Sam Brownback and to endorse his Democratic opponent. That intra-party Republican bloodbath may be taking a toll on Roberts as well. But here's the catch. Roberts has two opponents this fall. There's Democrat Chad Taylor. He's a district attorney from the Topeka area. And there's independent Greg Orman, a businessman who used to be a Democrat. And look at this. In the new poll, Roberts is leading, but with only 32 percent of the vote, with Taylor, the Democrat, at 25, and Orman, the independent, at 23 and Taylor has struggled to raise money so far and to attract support from his own party. And now there are even some suggesting that he drop out of the race to give Orman a clear shot at knocking off Roberts. Taylor is scoffing at that talk, but look at this. In a two-way race, the same poll shows that Roberts, the Republican, would lose to Orman by 10 points, 43 to 33. Like I said, this feels like a race you're going to want to keep an eye on this fall. And joining me now to talk about it is the independent candidate for Senate in Kansas, Greg Orman. Greg, thanks for taking a few minutes this morning. So let's just understand where you're coming from here uh, ideologically, because you, I think six years ago when Pat Roberts was last up for re-election, you initially were interested in running against him as a Democrat. Now you're running as an independent. Why aren't you a Democrat anymore? Well, you know, I'm, I'm fiscally responsible and socially tolerant and, and have never really felt like I had a perfect home in, in either party. Uh, historically, I've, I've tried the Republican Party, I've tried the Democratic Party, and I've just finally decided that if we're going to change things in Washington, uh, we've got to attack the two-party system and stop supporting it. Do you want, because you look at those numbers and it just screams out, if this is a one-on-one -on -one race, you have a real shot here uh, to knock off Pat Roberts. If it is a three-way race, it's muddled and it's a lot more complicated for you. Do you want uh, your Democratic opponent to drop out of this race? Well, we actually think that, that our message uh, resonates with Kansans from across the political spectrum, and we think we can win a three-way three race. So uh, from our perspective, our job is really just to go out, talk to Kansans, deliver our message to them, and, and, uh, and make sure that they have the opportunity to make an informed decision in the fall. And I think if they have that opportunity, I think they're going to see uh, that they like what they're hearing from our campaign. And I should note that we reached out to Chad Taylor, invited him onto the program, and we'd extend that invitation for the future as well. Well, uh, but Greg, let me ask you then, if you are successful, the million dollar question I think everybody will be asking you during this campaign is, you're going to have to choose sides in the Senate. Do you want to give, uh, do you want to vote to give Democrats control of the Senate or Republicans control of the Senate? Even if you're an independent, if you were elected, you could have the deciding vote after this fall's election. Which side would you vote for? Well, you know, I, I think that's a great point, Steve. And, and ultimately, if I get elected, uh, there's a reasonable chance that neither party uh, will have a majority in Washington. And if that's the case, uh, what I've said is I'm going to caucus with whichever party is willing to actually go to Washington and start trying to solve problems as opposed to just pleasing uh, the extremists in their own base. But do you, um, well, do you, well, looking at those two parties right now, do you have a sense which one has done a better job of that? Well, you know, I, uh, frankly, I think both parties have been sending, uh, sending extremists to Washington. People are more interested in pleasing the partisans in their own base and, and really not solving problems. And, and I think both, both parties are actually guilty of that sort of behavior, really, I think, in an attempt to make sure they win elections and not, uh, not solve problems for the American people. Uh, let's try to nail you down on a few issues here. The Affordable Care Act, obviously, everybody talks about it a lot. People who say repeal the Affordable Care Act, is that something you agree with? 
Well, you know, I, I look at this issue a little differently. We had a health care affordability issue before the Affordable Care Act, and we have a health care affordability issue today. Uh, I run businesses, and every year the first question we have to answer uh, before we can decide what kind of raises we can give our employees is how high have health care costs going, gone. And every year they just keep going up. So I, I think we have a real issue with health care in this country. And, and I think the Affordable Care Act has just been a lightning rod for political criticism and for political positioning uh, on both sides. But, but, and, Greg, and but Greg, it's, it's, it's yeah. the law. So do you want the law to stay on the books and to, and to work to try to improve the law, or do you want the law off the books? Well, as, as long as the president's in the White House, I, I think it's impractical to say that the law is going to go off the books. So I, I think what we ultimately need to do is look at the things that are driving health care costs in this country and try to, try to solve the problem in a real rational, common sense way, uh, as opposed to positioning for political gain here. Kansas, your state, Sam Brownback, the Republican governor, very conservative Republican governor, has refused to expand Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act. That's an option that the states have. Do you want your state, do you want Kansas to expand Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act? Well, you know, I think the message that Governor Brownback has sent to the working poor in Kansas is if you have a health care crisis, uh, your best solution is, is to quit your job. Uh, and I think that's a bad message to send. I think we have, um, we have a real issue in Kansas with our critical access facilities uh, that are now underfunded as a result of Governor Brownback's decision. And, and so ultimately, uh, I, I think he's, he's made a poor decision there. So you, you would like it expanded. And on the question of immigration, uh, this has been the issue, one of the issues that seems to have paralyzed Washington. Uh, a bill passed the Senate last year, it's, it's languishing in the House, that would provide a path to citizenship. It would boost up a border security and provide a long-term path to citizenship somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 13 years uh, for uh, undocumented people who meet certain thresholds and pay certain fines. Is that legislation that you would support in the Senate? Well, and, and Steve, I think you raised a critical point there, which is it does boost border security. And so we've talked about our, our immigration reform and said uh, it needs to be tough, practical, and fair. It does need to boost border security, but it also needs to be practical. We've got over 11 million people living in this country, and it's just impractical to say that we're going to, we're going to send them all home. And frankly, in Kansas, uh, there are whole industries and whole towns like Garden City and Dodge City that would be absolutely devastated if we made decisions like that. But I also think it needs to be fair to taxpayers. And what I mean by that is I think if you're, if you're here on an undocumented basis, you should have to register with ICE. Uh, you should have to pay a fine or perform some community service as an acknowledgement that the law has been broken. Uh, and then I think if you obey our laws, you hold down a job, you pay taxes, you should be able to stay here. All right, Greg, and one quick final question. Are you voting for Sam Brownback or Paul Davis for governor? You know, you know, I'm not making that uh, decision public. I think your voting behavior is, is ultimately a private behavior. Uh, I'm looking for people who want to go to Washington, and in this case, go to Topeka, uh, and solve problems, work in a bipartisan way, understand that Kansas right. uh, has a long tradition of bipartisanship, and, and that's what I'm looking for uh, in uh, elected officials. All right. My thanks to Greg Orman, Senate candidate in Kansas, for joining us this morning.